I'm Billy Hunt. If you're new here or you're a visitor, and uh, I teach the ladies, and sometimes I get to teach everybody. And tonight is one of those nights I'm so delighted. It always thrills me when Pastor asked me to fill the pulpit. And so uh, I welcome you. I welcome those of you online. And uh, we're going to study the Word of God, and God's going to do some exciting things for us. I want to begin tonight with stewardship. You know, pastor's been teaching you on the Lord's Prayer, which is found in the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know if you knew that. I'm, I don't know whether, I don't remember whether he mentioned it or not. But uh, the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's also found in the book of Luke. I love it because Jesus himself is teaching. So I thought tonight that I would bring our stewardship scripture from a portion of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is Jesus talking. So let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And this is what it says. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you. Now, that's a real interesting passage. Actually, the King James says, do your alms. And alms are really gifts to the poor, but that could cover any of your giving, any kind of giving that you have, whether it's tithes, offerings, missions giving, giving to the poor. It's really talking about how you give. And I think it's interesting because there's several words that, uh, that catch my attention and maybe they caught yours. One of the words was the word reward. He said that the hypocrites have their reward already. And he said, at the end, he said that the Father will reward you if you do it correctly. So there are rewards for giving. You don't give to get, but you do need to be aware that the Lord repays you. The Lord blesses you. He says in Malachi that when you bring tithe and offerings into the house of the Lord, he will open the windows of heaven and he will pour you out blessings so great that he, it, he says your barns or your storehouses, but that's our banks. Your bank account could not contain it all. So it's the Lord's intention to bless you. But this particular passage gives you insight into how that blessing can come to you. Notice that he says, when, when, this, uh, when the uh, hypocrites give, they, give, they get a reward. And he tells you what their motive is in giving. And your reward comes from your motive. So he says they go to the streets. I think this is hilarious. They sounded trumpets got everybody's attention when they were going to give a gift. They wanted everybody to know they were going to give a gift. They wanted to be seen as charitable, generous, wonderful people. And so they got, their, they got what they wanted. People saw them and said, wow, there they are. They're giving a gift. How wonderful. Period. That was the end of their reward. But God says, I want you to have a greater reward than that. So when you give... This is the next thing he said that I thought was so interesting. When you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Jesus said that. Did you know that's impossible? I know many of you don't know what a check is, but a check is a little piece of paper that you, those of us that are over the age, a certain age, know what a check is. And if you wrote your check behind your back, so your left hand couldn't see what your right hand was writing. Your left hand would still know what your right hand was doing. So what did he mean? Well, the reason your left hand knows what your right hand is doing is because they're both connected to your brain. And your brain knows what you're doing. So both of your hands know. So what was he doing? Well, he gave us a little insight. He said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. But when you give, give in secret. Say secret. That's the most wonderful word. I think of Psalms um, 91. It says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High 
When God speaks of that word secret, you can do a, a research. I did a long research on it, the word secret in the Bible. And I discovered that it means in God's presence, in the, in the arena of the spirit of God. So what is he telling you? When you give your tithe, when you give your offering, when you give to special things, don't do it from your brain. Don't let your natural thinking direct you, but listen for the spirit of the Lord. Listen. Now, you really don't need to listen too closely about tithing because he's very specific about tithing. He says it's 10%. But all of, he's specifically talking about charitable giving in this scripture. And in charitable giving, the Lord will, and now you, how do I know when the Lord's telling me to give? Well, you'll just have this strong desire in your heart to give. You'll just feel like, I just really want to give to that. And that's how you know the Holy Spirit is telling you to give. When Matt's going to build playgrounds in another nation and you watch the video and something inside you says, oh, I wish I could go. Have you ever felt like that? Actually, I have not felt like that about building <laughs> playgrounds. But I have felt like I'd like to help them. I'd like to help them. And so we have. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? So when you give, always give from the secret place of God's presence. When you, when you get your phone out and you're, and you're giving online, don't just say, oh, well, you know, here's my 10%. I'm just going to put it in here. No, 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 don't do that. Say, Lord, I'm giving from my heart. I love you. And I want to, I want to please you. And I know this pleases you. And I also know that you said, now, I, the other thing about that I want to point out, I almost skipped it. It says, and he will see you in secret in the realm of the spirit, from your communication with him. But he will reward you openly. What does that mean? It means in the natural realm. It means you're going to give to him from your spirit. You're communicating with him from the spirit. You're giving by faith. You're trusting God that he will meet your needs. You're trusting God. He's going to open the windows of heaven, and he's going to begin to pour you out blessings, and he can't resist it. He does. He does. So give. And give from the secret place and let God bless you. Let me pray over your finances. Father, here we sit in your presence. And I know there are people in this building that have a real financial need. Lord, I pray that you will begin to stir in their spirit and that their giving motivation will begin to come from their spirit. I ask you, Lord, you said I will supply all of your needs according to my riches in glory. So I ask you, Father, to do that for every person in this building. If they need a job, lead them to the right job, a job they will love, a job with good benefits, and a job with a really good salary. I thank you, Lord, that you will bless us over in abundance, over all that we could imagine, because we love you and we give from our spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now I can teach you what I want to teach you. Actually... Pastor's been teaching you on the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer, I love the Lord's Prayer. It's also found in the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Lord's, the Lord's Prayer is a scaffolding. Pastor said this one night when he was teaching. It's a scaffolding that you can really hang any prayer on. If you will just look, if you didn't, if you haven't heard him, if you haven't been here, you need to go back online to the uh, arc.com. Arc is that what it is? No, not info. It's the, anyway, go to our website. For, <laughs> go to our website and, and our YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube, on the YouTube channel also. And listen to those lessons that he taught on the Lord's Prayer. It's powerful. It'll change your prayer life. And so when we were talking and he was asking me if I'd like to teach tonight, of course I said yes. Uh, I, he said, uh, would you like to teach on prayer? Would you like to continue on with prayer? And of course I said yes, because I have several favorite subjects. I love to teach on prayer. I love to teach on, teach on faith. And I love to teach on worship. Those are my three favorite subjects to talk about in the whole Bible. And so tonight, I'm going to teach you a lesson on prayer. It will also be, part of it will be taken out of the Sermon on the Mount. But I want to start with a scripture in James. I want to start with James 5.16. This is a powerful, powerful verse. It says, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer, this is from the Amplified Bible, 
of a righteous man, and I might say our woman, makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. Now, notice it's the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer, not the casual prayer, not the now I lay me down to sleep prayer, not the God is good, God is great, let us thank him for this food prayer, but the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman makes tremendous power available. Actually, prayer is the most powerful action in the spiritual realm that there is. There's nothing more powerful than prayer. But we must learn the secrets of powerful prayer. How do we make our prayers effectual? And how do we make our prayers fervent? Well, I want to talk to you about that tonight. When you pray, you may not be aware of this, but when you pray, you touch three worlds. Prayer always touches heaven. God is listening. Don't ever think God is too busy for your slightest common little prayer. He's listening. He's listening. It touches heaven. It touches the heart of God when you pray. But it also touches hell. You say, what in the world do you mean? I mean it touches hell. It will stop the power of the enemy in your life. It will stop the strategy. In fact, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And the gates, the strategies of hell will not prevail against my church. You happen to be a part of that church. That means it is God's plan and purpose that no strategy that Satan will plan against you will work. If he's coming against you, we're here to stand with you and to drive him off tonight. I, I just confess with my mouth before all of you that when we walk out the doors tonight, we're all going to be free and full of power because we're going to pray together. Joel Osteen quotes this, and, and when he first started quoting this scripture, I'm fixing to quote to you. I, I looked and looked for it. I couldn't find it It was because it was an unusual translation. I finally found it in, in the Living Bible, but I love it. He, I, I've quoted it all the time, and I needed to know the address. I like to know the address of the scriptures that I quote. Psalms 56, verse 9. Did, did I have in, that in? Yes. Psalms 56, verse 9 says, The very day I call for help, the day that we prayed, the tide of the battle turned, and my enemies flee. This one thing I know, God is for me. He just quotes it the day we prayed, the tide of the battle turned. So I had to get the whole thing. But it, that's the truth. No matter what's happening in your life, when you begin to understand the power of prayer and you begin to activate the power of God in your life through prayer, the tide of the battle begins to turn. And you can know God is working for you. He is working for me. I love that song. The battle belongs to the Lord. So first of all, let me define prayer for you. I'm not going to give you long definitions, but there are two uh, oriental authors who've written little books on prayer, and each of them has something real interesting to say about prayer that I want to share with you. The first one is a guy named Watchman Nee, and he wrote a little book called Let Us Pray. In that book, he said, prayer is none other than the act of the believer working together with God. Prayer is the union of the believer's thoughts with the will of God. So it's joining our will with the will of God. Now listen, this is what I wanted, this is what he said that I think is so powerful. Prayer does not alter what God has predetermined. Rather, it achieves what he has already ordained. But now listen to this line. However, Prayerlessness, if we fail to pray, does affect a change because God will wait for someone to pray and to cooperate with him in prayer before he acts on the earth. Wow, that's really a heavy thought. You know, you don't think it's not important when you pray. When God drops somebody into your heart, pray for them. Pray for them. Now, I could, you know, I think of a personal time in my life. My dad, my dad was a Houston ship channel pilot. I don't know if you know what that is, but it, I always was so proud of my dad because he went two miles out in the Gulf and he climbed up on those ships and he brought them in. It was illegal for them to come into port without a pilot on board. And they, uh, they had little boats that they call pilot boats, sort of like a, a little 
cabin cruiser type thing, tugboat, that would take them out to the ships. And they got a new one. And they went to New Orleans to get it. And Dad went with them. And the night that he went, my mother came into my bedroom. I was a teenager. And she, and she woke me up and she said, Billy, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I, I, the Lord's calling me to pray. Let's pray. And when we knelt down beside the bed, she said, she said I felt like we need to pray for Daddy. And we began to pray. And when we began to pray, we began to weep and cry and intercede in the spirit for my daddy. We had no idea what was going on. But we prayed and we prayed. I don't know how long we prayed, 10, 15, 20. I don't know how long we prayed, quite a while. And then all of a sudden, it lifted. Well, the next day, we found out what we were praying about. The radar went out on that boat, and it ran into the jetties. And it was stormy, and it sunk. And my dad had to hang on to the jetties in stormy weather and wait for the Coast Guard to rescue them. And nobody was lost. And nobody was injured. You think it had anything to do with prayer? Boy, I do. I do. Don't ignore the call to pray. God is waiting for someone. Intercede for our nation. God is waiting for someone to intercede for our nation, for our world, for the people around us. I love to pray on the way to work when the, when the freeways are packed with people. I love to pray for lost, dying, dying humanity. I ask the Lord to save all those folks, to remove the blindness from them. I intercede for humanity because they're all around me. So don't, don't, let, don't let anything keep you from praying because prayerlessness will keep the will of God from happening in your life. And uh, here's the next one. It's from Paul Youngie Cho from his little book, Praying with Jesus. Both of these are tiny little books. You can read them in about an hour. In short, he says, prayer is a dialogue with God. And I'm gonna, he goes on about other things, but I, the word there I want to impress you with is dialogue. Do you know what a dialogue is? Most of us, our prayers are monologues. A monologue is when you do all the talking. A dialogue is when more than one person is communicating. Now here's the shame about us doing all the talking. God created the heavens and the earth. He knows what's going to happen before it happens. He has the power to destroy or make new. He has the power to heal. He, God is all powerful and he has all knowledge. Why would we think we could tell him what he needs to do? Now, I'm not saying you don't need to share your, well, I'm going to show you exactly a, a three-step prayer that will help you. But I'm saying that when we pray, we need to make it a dialogue. And I'm going to show you how to do that tonight. I'm going to show you how not only to tell God what you need. You know, we, it's, like a, it, it's like a grocery list with a lot of us when we go to God. Now, God, I need this and I need this and I need this. And could you give it to me quickly? <laughs> no, that, that won't get it, folks. That's not going to get your prayers answered. So tonight, we're going to talk about how to dialogue with God. In Acts chapter 4, there's a, there's a narrative of the early disciples. Jesus had gone back to heaven. He'd left the Holy, he'd sent the Holy Spirit. They'd been empowered with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was leading and guiding them. They began to preach. They began to heal the sick. And nobody, nobody was upset more than the scribes and Pharisees. They didn't like it. They stopped them. They said, what do you think you're doing? What, what, what are you doing? Well, we're healing the sick in the name of Jesus. Well, you can't do that. Don't use that name anymore. In fact, they arrested them. They beat them. And finally, they let them go. And when they went back to the church and they reported to the church what had happened to them because they were obeying Jesus, they began to pray. Now, I think it's interesting. They didn't pray, oh, God, get them. Get them. Get even with them. They wouldn't let us. No, that's not how they prayed. They said, Lord, you've heard their threatenings. You've seen what happened to us. They didn't say, don't make us preach anymore, Lord. We don't want to be put in jail. No, no. They said, Lord, grant that, that we can speak the word of God with boldness and that signs and wonders will be done through the name of your son, Jesus. And then listen to this verse in Acts 4.31. This is how the Lord responded to that prayer. 
After they prayed, not before, not even during, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. What would we do if while praying this building began to shake? Some of us would run out thinking it was going to collapse. The place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, remember what they prayed? Grant that we can speak your word with boldness. And they began to speak the word of God boldly. He gave them exactly what they asked for. And in addition to that, he let them have a visitation from the Holy Spirit that actually shook the building. So I have three questions to ask you. When was the last time your prayers were so effective that they caused an actual shaking in your circumstances? You actually saw a change in your circumstances as a result of your prayer. Second question. When was the last time your prayer was so effective that it caused the Holy Spirit of God to respond with action? Third one. When was the last time your prayer was so flooded, so effective that it flooded over into your mouth and gave you wisdom? Well, if you can't say that's happened to you recently, listen closely. We're going to talk about Three simple little steps. I call it a recipe for prayer. Three simple little steps that will help you. So let's begin by reading a, just a simple scripture I base this on. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. <clears throat> Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. You say, what in the world does that have to do with prayer? Well, you're going to find out. Listen carefully. And you might want to get your pencil out to take some notes. The first one, ask, has to do with the beginning of prayer. All prayer begins with petition. You, that's just what the, the Bible tells us that, that the Lord wants us to ask. He wants us to ask. In fact, he says in John, ask and ask largely. In other words, don't just say, no, Lord, I just want to ask for one little tiny thing. No, ask and ask largely that your joy may be full. That's what Jesus said. So we have to ask. I don't know why we have to ask. He knows what we need before we ask, but he says you have to ask. It begins with petition. The beginning of effective prayer is petition. Let's look at a few verses. I have, I think, three or, three or four. Let's look at the first one. Up to this time, this is Jesus talking, up to this time, you've not asked a single thing in my name. They had never used Jesus' name in prayer. And now ask and keep on asking that you will receive so that your joy, your gladness, your delight may be full and complete. So Jesus says to ask. Jesus said to ask. Let's look at the next one. This is in Jeremiah. Call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you don't know. Wow, that's a great promise, isn't it? Call and I'll answer. You got to ask. Here's the third one. You have not because you do not ask. Or when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now that's really a transitional verse to the next step. Because I think one of the main reasons that we don't pray effectively is we do not pray according to the will of God. Or we're praying for something that's just to satisfy our flesh or give us something our flesh wants that wouldn't be good for us necessarily. So there has to be a way for us to discover how to effectively pray God's will and how to find out what God's will is for every situation in our life. And so that takes us to the second one. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Well, what does that have to do? Well, partly that's listening prayer, but it's really finding the promise that goes with your petition. Finding the promise. You say, what promise? When I was a little girl in Sunday school, we used to sing this little song. Every promise in the book is mine. Every, anybody here know that song? Every chapter, every verse, every line. All the something of his love, greatness, wonders of his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. The Bible is filled with promises. Filled with promises. That's why we try to get you to read 365 with us. 
Because if you'll just read every day, you'll begin to see the promises of God. And when you hit a rough spot, you'll learn how to look for the scripture that goes with your petition. It's not for God's sake that you have to find the promise. It's for your sake. Because many times we are just not convinced that God wants to do for us what we're asking him to do. You know, if you don't believe <coughs> that God heals today, then you'll have trouble believing God wants to heal you. If you do not believe that it's God's will that you prosper in or in health as your soul prospers, then you will not be able to believe God to supply your financial needs. Are you getting this? If you do not understand that the Bible promises that all your children will be disciples taught of the Lord, always obedient to the voice of the Lord, and great will be the peace of your children, then you won't be convinced that it's God's will for all your children to be saved. In fact, concerning salvation, if you've never seen the verse that says it is not God's will that one human being perish, but that all come to repentance, you will not be able to pray with confidence that everybody you know will find Jesus. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, how, so what do we do? Well, we got to find the promise that goes with our petition. Because if we don't, we may have a wrong motive in our prayer, and the Lord wants to expose that. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, you know what that means? That means when you find a promise in the word of God and you bring it to God, he says, yes, this is from my word. I promise this. I'll do this for you. Now, then it says on the earth, we say the amen. The word amen means so be it. So we agree with God and we say, I'll take it. Amen. I take my healing. I take prosperity. I take salvation for my family. I take, I take the leading of the Spirit. I take anointing when I speak because I know it's, it's God's will for my life. <clears throat> everything around you, everything exists because God spoke it into existence. He created the earth with his words. I love Hebrews 4.12 in the Amplified Bible. This is a powerful scripture. <clears throat> For the word that God speaks, this is his word. This is his word down here in my Bible. For the word that God speaks is alive and full of power. Now look at this. Making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. Now just hold it up there for a minute. That means when I pray the word of God, God's words, God's words from the Bible are energized. They're effective. They're full of power. They're operative, energizing, and effective. And they're sharper than any two-edged sword. They will penetrate to the, to the dividing line of the breath of life, your soul, and your immortal spirit, and of the joints and marrows, and of the deepest parts of our nature. You know, it's, it says that if you pray amiss, that you may devour it on your own nature. Well, the Word of God divides. The Word of God exposes. The Word of God shows you if you're praying correctly or if you're not praying correctly. And it'll help you pray with power. Then you can say the effectual fervent prayer of me is powerful because of the Word of God. The Word will show us when we're praying God's will and when we are not. You know, uh, if you are struggling with sickness... In fact, there's a scripture in James that I want us to look at because it gives us an example of this. Put that James scripture up there. James 5, 13 through 16. Is any one of you in trouble? Let them pray. So if you're having problems in your life, you need to pray. And this is the Bible telling you it's God's will for you to pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Now listen, look at this one. Is anyone among you sick? It doesn't say let them call the doctor. It doesn't say call 911. It says call the elders of the church to pray over you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. And look what it says. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise them up. If you're struggling with sickness, I encourage you to get in our healing classes. Listen, we do everything we can to minister to you. And the healing classes are powerful. We've seen many miracles from people who took part in those healing classes. They said, well, I'm not sure I believe it's God's will to heal me. Well, let me tell you it is. 
It is. Well, I know somebody who died. I know lots of people who died. But that doesn't change that it's God's will to heal. Don't try to figure out why people die. You don't know. You can't figure it out. You're not that smart. Leave it with God. But as far as you're concerned, decide, I'm going to get healed. Get in healing class. Find out what the Word says about healing. If you're depressed, if you're suicidal, if you're overwhelmed, then you need to call our counseling number. And you need to find out what the Word has to say about your problem. They'll help you. They'll help you. Prayer will help you in times of trouble and depression. Praise should be the result of our prayers. Prayer offered in faith will bring healing, and prayer is powerful and effective. The Word is also our only weapon in spiritual warfare. I love the songs we sang tonight. Did you love the songs we sang tonight? I'm telling you, I lift my hands in the battle. My war cry is praise. And I want you to know that prayer is also very, very, very important to spiritual warfare. A lot of what happens to us is Satan attacking us. Don't let anybody tell you he does not attack you. John 10, 10 says that's his job description. The thief has come to kill, steal, and destroy. It's, it's not God's. God didn't do that. God did not come to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, I came to give you life and that more abundantly. So if the enemy's attacking you, you need to know that prayer is a weapon and praise is a weapon in our warfare. Ephesians six seventeen is the scripture on warfare. And so let's read it. It says, take the helmet that's given you all of the, you know, really the 90% of our warfare is getting dressed according to Ephesians 6, all ladies like that. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Now this is the only weapon we're given. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God is a weapon. God's word is a weapon. And then he tells us how to use it. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayers and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance, supplication. For, now, hold it just for a minute. Notice we're to pray the word, and it uses the word perseverance. In other words, don't stop. Don't stop until you win. Don't stop until you win. Have you ever heard someone called a prayer warrior? Well, I hope that you can call me a prayer warrior. Because I'm telling you, when I'm like a little, I used to have a poodle, and I'm sure it was nothing like Pastor's poodle. But I used to have a female poodle, and, uh, and I used to play with her with a, a little rag, and she'd grab hold of that rag, and she, anybody have a dog that would do this? And she would pull on that rag. She wouldn't let go. I used to say, I think I could twirl her over my head, and she wouldn't let go of that rag. That's the way I am in prayer. I'm telling you, when I find it in the Word that I can have it, when I see the enemy attacking me, you can lay down and die if you want to. I'm not going to. I'm going to be like one of those little hula dancers that you stick on your dashboard. When, when you knock that thing down, it jumps back up and keeps dancing. And I want to be like that in prayer. The devil may knock me down, but I'm going to jump right back up, and I'm going to keep praying and praising and believing God. I have a Bible called a Spirit-Filled Bible. Anybody else got one of those? It has little notes in it. And there's a little note by this scripture. And this is what it says. Prayer is not so much a weapon or even a part of our armor as it is the means by which we engage in the battle itself. So the word is the weapon, but we engage with our prayer and the purpose for which we are armed. We are armed to fight the devil through our prayers of the word, through calling forth God's word and throwing it in the devil's face. Now, you know, we have a really good example of that in the Bible. His name is Jesus. When he was in the temptation, every time the enemy tested him, how did he answer? It is written. It is written. I have said that to him so many times. This is unlawful, devil, because it is written. And I tell him what is written, as though he doesn't know. It's probably been thrown in his face so much, he could probably quote the whole Bible to you, but he doesn't like it because it drains him of power. It drains him of power. Once you find your promise, and you say, Billy, I just don't know if I can find. If you have trouble searching the word, come and see me. I have a little book called Prayer. 
And it has in the back of it scriptures you can pray over just about anything. And I'll give you a copy of that book if you need it, if you need to find some scriptures. So, so we've asked, we've sought, we've found the scripture. And now here's the last thing. And boy, I think I have one minute to do this. Knock. What does it mean to knock? Well, if I go to your house and I knock on your door, what am I saying? Open this door. Open this door. If I come to your house and you're my friend and I knock on the door and you don't answer it and I smell chocolate chip cookies, <laughs> I'll go to the back door. I'll bang on the windows until you open that door. That is what that knocking is about. It's speaking the word and speaking the word and praying the word and praying the word. How long do I have to do it? Till the answer comes. Till the answer comes. One last scripture, lest I get in deep trouble with my pastor for going over. Isaiah 62, 6. This is possibly my favorite scripture in the Bible on prayer. It's two verses. Do you have it? I had to skip something, didn't you? I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, who will never hold their peace day or night. You, all of you, who are God's servants, <clears throat> By your prayers, put the Lord in remembrance of his promises. Keep not silent. Give him no rest until he establishes. Now, it says Jerusalem, but you can put anything there. Establishes my family. Establishes my finances. Establishes my health. As whatever you need, put it there and makes it a praise in the earth. I'm looking for a praise in the earth. I'm looking for a testimony. And you need to, too. Say, I'm a watchman. I'm on the walls. I'm going to get the word in my mouth. I'm going to pray it back to God. I'm got, not going to give him any rest until the answer comes. Did you enjoy that? Amen. Amen. Praise you, praise you. Let's just be quiet for a moment, bow our heads. You know, I believe in this building there are probably people. Maybe you're here, somebody brought you. Maybe the Holy Spirit pulled you in here, and you've never made the Lord your, your Lord. You've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. This is your opportunity. Or maybe you're here, and you've gotten away from the Lord, and you need to rededicate your life. You need to rededicate your life to the Lord. If either one of those things is you, slip your hand in the air quickly. All over the building, I'm looking. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. We're going to pray a prayer with you. Isn't it wonderful that we don't have to do something difficult for the Lord to save us, for the Lord to restore us? We just have to ask. So we're going to pray. Pray this prayer. We're all going to pray it with you. Pray this prayer with us. And as you pray this prayer, open your heart for the Lord to come in and change you and give you what you need. Pray with me. Dear God, I know mankind needs a Savior. And I cannot save myself. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Right now, I confess you as my Lord, as my Savior, as the one who forgives me and restores me. Thank you, Jesus. My past is forgiven. And I have a relationship with you. I'm a new creation in Christ because I've said yes to you. Now give me just a couple of minutes because there's something I think the Lord had, had told me to do at the end. But if you pray that prayer, down by your feet, there's a little card called a yes card. If you will fill that little card out or you can go online, um, it's, you can do whatever it is you do to that little thing. You can scan it. I'm old. I don't know about those things. You can scan that little thing, and, uh, and we will pray for you. I'm telling you, our prayers are powerful. The, when our staff gets together and prays, it's a powerful thing, and, and you will begin to see the tide of your battle turning. Now, the last thing I want to do is the Lord really quickened me that at the end of this service, I should have people who have a really, really big need in your life. Maybe you're going through something incredible, and you need God, to touch you and help you, I want to pray for you. Just stand to your feet right where you are. Don't be embarrassed about it. We all go through stuff. If that's you, and I know you're here because the Lord told me to do this, to pray over you. 
I don't have to know what you're going through. Jesus does. But it's an act of your faith to stand to your feet and get the prayer. And you know, if you just feel like standing in the middle of the prayer, stand. But right now, Father, I thank you for your word. Your word is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And I come against every strategy. I stand in the authority of the name of Jesus. Lord, you gave us authority over all the power of the enemy. So right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind the work of the enemy in every single person who is standing. Satan, I dismiss you from your assignment and I commend you to withdraw now. I thank you, Lord, that we are praying and that tonight the tide of the battle is turning and that revelation and insight and guidance will begin to come from the Holy Spirit in the lives of every person standing. Lord, I'm looking for miracles. I thank you. You are the God of miracles. And we thank you, Lord, from impossible situations. We sang about it tonight. You will bring miracles and we praise you for it in advance. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.